So I'm delighted to talk with you today about designing the optimal legal system for your SEZ, whether that's a region, a country, a seastead, or it won't be very long until we have communities on the moon and other planets. And so those are part of this discussion or our thought, our thinking, or should be as well. Here's our agenda. First, I'll talk about two tools that we have, not the only tools, and we don't want to limit our thinking to just common law and civil law, but these are two tools that we have at our disposal for designing the ideal legal system. Then balancing exploration and learning and standardization scalability as it applies to the law and society. Problems with civil law that we need to be cautious about and sensitive to. Look at a case studies of drones that compares uh, civil law and common law approaches. Uh, a question that many SEZs are interested in, which is how to turn your SEZ into a Silicon Valley, and finally, recommendations. And also, on your tables, there's a copy of a paper, uh, copies of a paper called Drones, Dangerous Animals, and Peeping Toms, uh, from which many of the item, uh, ideas in this talk are taken. So let's start out by looking at our two tools, first uh, common law and then civil law. So common law originated, originated in medieval England. It started with the Magna Carta. Originally, it provided for rights for barons only against the crown, private property, no taxation without representation, and so forth. Only later was it demanded by and extended to commoners. Common law is also often referred to as a judge-made law, which is uh, it is decided by judges in courts of law. Uh, it uh, re is, is very modest and economical in that it is only, its only objective is to resolve disputes, which of course inevitably arise. Uh, so it doesn't try to set policy. It doesn't try to anticipate all the disputes that will arise in the future. It just uh, addresses uh, disputes and issues as they arise. It makes use of the reasonable man or person uh, standard, which is what would seem most reasonable to a reasonable person in this jurisdiction. And therefore, it's inextricably linked and evolves with customs and the society. Uh, it is uncodified. Prior to the invention of the printing press, it was completely uncodified. After the printing press, at least cases were written down, decisions were written down, and, uh, but uh, no attempt uh, is made uh, it, within just the realm of common law to uh, aggregate and make sense of all of these uh, decisions. Rather, uh, it exists as the huge database of all the preceding decisions. It evolves as cases are decided. And it doesn't provide clear and fast rules, but it does provide precedents to which we can hark uh, for, for guidance. And as I said, uh, it's open-ended and only addresses issues as they arise. And it's open-ended in the sense that issues are all, always arising. Now, some 60 former British colonies and protectorists have inherited at least some level of common law tradition and including all of these uh, countries listed here and many others, the USA, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and so on. Now, in contrast, uh, civil law originated in the continental Europe. Uh, and by civil law, I'm referring to statutes, regulations, and executive orders. Uh, these, uh, in, in Roman times, emperors and legislatures provided rules for judges to follow. Uh, the continental civil law got a big boost in the early 19th century with Napoleon, who codified uh, French law and created the Napoleonic Code. This brought clarity and consistency to the law in France, uh, but it also limited the abilities of judges. They could only apply, not make law. Uh, and, of course, that had the advantage of helping Napoleon consolidate power because now he could decide what the judges could do. Uh, a, a downside was it disempowered judges from finding better resolutions if resolutions between two litigants that were better were available. Uh, civil law has generally become the legal regime of choice for politicians worldwide. 
Uh, it's been referred to as policy implementing rather than dispute resolving, as is the case with common law. And here's a quote from Ponzetto, which I think is uh, telling. England had legislation since the Middle Ages, but pre-20th century, it used legislation only sparingly and reluctantly, preferring instead to use common law. So France, Spain, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, and their former colonies have primarily inherited civil law traditions. As we'll see, every country on earth uses a combination of the two traditions, uh, but there's, there are clear biases uh, in, and there are the former uh, British colonies, which have more of a common law uh, tradition than the former uh, European power colonies. Now, just to be very clear, uh, civil law has two meanings. It can mean either non-criminal law, in which case it's distinguished from criminal law, or it can mean legislative, statutory, administrative law and regulations, in which case it's distinguished from common law. Of course, it's in this second sense of the word that I'm using uh, the term civil law here. Here's another way to look at it. Think of these two cubes as the possibilities of everything that people could do or conceive of doing. Uh, I draw them as three-dimensional cubes. Of course, the number of dimensions are in the millions of possibilities. Well, common law uh, identifies what is disallowed. It presumes the freedom and rights of individuals. Uh, and civil law uh, specifies what is allowed it presumes that rights and freedoms are granted by the state. Uh, so that is a broad uh, distinction between the two forms of law. How the two forms of law evolve over time is also different. So common law evolves continuously through real world cases. Many decisions take place in parallel through uh, courts of law throughout the land. As a result, there's a variation and selection that naturally happens as cases are decided differently. Particular cases are used as precedents more and more, and uh, thus they gain share of the decision making for the whole land. Uh, common law is, can be referred to as a structure without design. I think of it as analogous to the anthill. None of the ants decide that the anthill will be a beautiful symmetrical pyramid, do they? No, the pyramid emerges from the independent actions of all of the ants, each doing their own thing. Similarly is common law, a structure that emerges from all of these uh, bottom-up decisions. As a result of all of this, common law has been shown to be less predictable in the short term, because you never know how a particular decision is going to be made, but more predictable long term than civil law, because huge jumps don't take place as they can, and changes as they can so readily with civil law. It's also been referred to as organic or anti-fragile in the world's words of Taleb, the financial writer. Now in contrast, civil law evolves at fixed points of time when the law is drafted, vetted, negotiated, and enacted, and periodically thereafter when it's revised and amended. So, uh, it's not the smooth, continuous process of evolution in civil law that we see in common law. And as a result of that, again, studies that are cited in this paper have shown that uh, civil law is more predictable in the short term, but less predictable long term. That's known as regime uncertainty, when a single legislature or uh, executive can make a decision that vastly changes the law in the region. Uh, so uh, uh, civil law has been referred to as designed or imposed as opposed to organic and anti-fragile. Current status today, every country, as I mentioned, in the world uses a mix of both traditions. Civil law is, has some key advantages I don't want to overlook. Uh, it is more practical, practical, scalable, and efficient when cases are numerous and similar. Traffic tickets, for example. Also for public goods and commons, like air pollution and nat national defense, where there's no clear, well-defined property rights, uh, civil law plays a role. Uh, and um, often civil law is uh, 
common law simply codified at a point in time. For example, most critical, most criminal law in the U.S. is uh, a codification of common law. That's a good thing that civil law has turned to common law for guidance because common law has been through this vetting process uh, and evolutionary process uh, and when it's captured by civil law. Trends, uh, the U.S. has shifted in the 20th century or did shift from primarily being a common law country to one that's primarily uh, statutory according to Calabrese. And increasingly worldwide, civil law is supplanting common law. So uh, those are distinctions between civil law and common law. Now, common law and civil law are very analogous to exploration and exploitation. What do I mean by that? This is a trade-off and optimization that is common to many disciplines and domains uh, throughout life. Biology, corporate strategy, uh, manufacturing, I could go on and on. So the, the, an animal, for example, forages for food. It's exploring different regions, and when it finds a region where there's plenty of food, it stays there to eat the food. It, it explores, and then it exploits. Oil and gas drilling. We just don't drill an uh, oil well anywhere. We explore first, and when we find a promising area, then we concentrate on that area. Uh, product market fit and manufacturing. Before scaling up a large-scale uh, manufacturing plant, we, of course, do market testing to make sure there's demand for that product. And of course, there are risks in every case, aren't there? Because the environment can change, and that big investment that we've made in manufacturing plant can shift. So you can see there's <clears throat> uh, an optimization problem. How much of our resource do we put into exploration? How much in exploitation? Portfolio management, same thing. Uh, these share stocks seem to be doing well, so I'll invest in those. But I have to be cautious, because just because they've done well in the past doesn't mean they'll continue to do well in the future. So exploration and, and learning inform exploration and standardization. The goal is to optimize something, survival, revenue, prediction, accuracy. And in the real world, there's no single optimal trade-off, so it's a constant challenge. Um, here's another way to think about it. Think of this landscape, and we explore different parts of it until we discover the most attractive parts, in this case, the peak, and then once we discover that, we exploit that peak. But of course, the landscape is constantly changing, isn't it? If there changes the environment, competitors, technologies are changing. So uh, if it's changing continuously, then we need to do exploration continuously. Uh, and other broad guidelines that uh, we can infer are the greater uncertainty in the environment and the society, the broader the territorial expanse and variation in the society, and the longer the potential payoffs, the greater the investment we need to make in exploration. So uh, this uh, begins to uh, illuminate for us how both common law and civil law play a role in our optimal legal system design for our SEZ. One conclusion we can draw is no civil law without being informed by common law. Otherwise, we're just uh, uh, shooting in the dark and guessing where uh, what will be the best fit for that society. Now, I said that in real-world cases, uh, there's no one common solu no optimal solution. Uh, and I thought I'd share with you a very fun uh, case of a very bounded, well-defined. Uh, optimization problem, uh, exploration, exploitation problem for which there is a well-defined solution just for fun. Let's say your job is to find the best secretary and you're going to have a chance to interview ten secretaries. But once you've interviewed one, if you don't hire them, you, don't, you can't go back. So uh, one approach for choosing the best secretary might be to sample uh, interview a few, see what the distribution is, uh, and then uh, choose the next best one that comes along that's better than any of the ones you've sampled. But the question is, how many, what percentage of all of them do you let go by? If you don't sample enough, you risk uh, uh, 
accepting something that's not optimal. If you let too many go by, then you have uh, already let the best one go by before you make your selection. So here are a whole bunch of different secretaries that you might hire. Which one do you like best? Uh, <laughs> okay, well, it turns out that for this very bounded, well-defined problem, there is a unique and optimal solution. Uh, it is to allow 1 over E, uh, or about 37% of the secretaries go by first, and then choose the next secretary that comes along that is better than any of the ones that you've interviewed up until that point. And if you follow this strategy, you can also prove that your chances of choosing the best secretary are 1 over E, about 37%. So uh, just a fun distraction. Thank you for letting me insert that. I thought you'd enjoy it. Uh, but uh, it's a very special case, uh, different from the real world where uh, there aren't uh, such closed-ended solutions. Let me talk about some of the concerns about civil law that we need to be cautious of as we design the optimal legal system for our SEZ. First, public choice concerns, factors unrelated to public welfare that influence law and regulation. And we heard quite a bit about those from Lada this morning. Unintended consequences, and finally, deterrence of entrepreneurship, innovation, and consequently, economic growth. First of all, public choice concerns. Here are three different types. Cronyism, that is benefiting a politically favored businesses and lobbies uh, in exchange for something that we want, their votes, their support for our campaigns, budgeting, what have you. Uh, generating agency revenue through licenses, penalties, and exemptions, insulating bureaucracies from risk. Uh, common law is much less susceptible to public choice concerns than civil law because the decision making is so broadly distributed among so many judges rather than centralized in the legislature or a chief executive. Uh, here are specific examples of public choice concerns. Uh, and I could go on and on uh, of lots of examples. Uh, one in particular that's, that's gotten attention recently is uh, even President Obama uh, noted it before the end of his term, which is uh, even a activity as innocuous as braiding hair requires a license in over half of the 50 US states. Uh, this is a activity and livelihood that's practiced primarily by young black women. And in some cases, you may have to shell out a couple of thousand dollars to get a license, a, cosmetological, a cosmetological license to braid hair. Uh, and that has been an obstacle to many of these young black women uh, pursuing their chosen field. So. Um, and of course, the benefit of that is that it provides barriers to entry to those who are already providing those services, so it insulates them from competition. And so they have a natural interest in uh, these regulations. So I'm not suggesting it's hard to get, it's easy to get rid of them, but uh, I'm, I'm calling out uh, the damage that they can do. Unintended consequences are another characteristic of civil law uh, regulations. So for example, the Affordable Care Act uh, has led to the conversion of full-time employees to part-time employees so that companies are not subject to some of the ACA's provisions. Minimum wages result in the reduction of the use of low-skilled labor by using robots and automation, which uh, eliminates the very jobs that those low-skilled people uh, might be candidates for. Rent control provides, uh, eliminates the incentive to improve your property or to build new properties, which results in less property and less high-quality property. High taxes on alcohol and cigarettes can lead to black markets in those industries. So uh, all of these are unintended consequences of civil law. Now, what, where do unintended consequences come from, and how, how is it that they arrive? Well, uh, they arise because economies and societies are complex adaptive systems. Now, complex adaptive systems are things like rainforest, stock exchanges, uh, marketplaces, the brain, 
And they are systems in which order arises bottom up from networks of interactions of lots of individuals or agents like people or neurons or species in a rainforest. People give rise to customs, buyers and sellers give, wages, give rise to wages and price levels, companies to supply chains and ecosystems. These are all examples of the order, different types of order, which arise from the interactions of all of these individuals or agents. Uh, such systems feature variation and selection, uh, which give rise to innovation and evolution. Uh, they are never at equilibrium, in spite of what they might have taught us in Econ 101, but uh, complex sys adaptive systems are dynamic. They're always changing. There can be feedback loops, which can lead to nonlinearities and uh, unpredictability. And if you try to con constrain these systems top down, you get unintended consequences. Specifically, the unintended consequences arise because the behavior of the complex system is determined by interacting factors on many dimensions. The statutes are constraints which tend to be, if not one dimensional, of lower dimensionality than the system. And then forces or tendencies along the other dimensions which are not seen adjust to and offset the constraints giving rise to the unintended consequences. I say more about this in my article, uh, and I'd be happy to talk more about it later if you wish. So uh, civil law, those are unintended consequences. Deterrence of entrepreneurship. There are three different ways that uh, civil law regulations can deter entrepreneurship, getting started, innovating, and expanding. We've seen the example of licenses, innovating. It takes R&D budget very often to comply with regulations, and expanding many uh, regulations only kick in when a company reaches a certain size, like 50 or 100 people, uh, and uh, so that's a way that it can uh, be destructive. Uh, it's difficult to point to a single law that would be a silver bullet to get rid of to promote entrepreneurship because the uh, most onerous regulations vary from industry to industry and region to region. And here are some examples of different ones. For example, in my industry, software development, it's very likely the limitation on, on H-1B visas. But uh, in, uh, in real estate and in uh, delivery services, it will be different. Uh, think of any metric that you can conceive of to assess the effectiveness of a particular entrepreneur. Your index uh, will probably be a composite of many different factors. The, the entrepreneur's passion, their perseverance, their skills, their education, their uh, resources, and so forth. Whatever index you come up with, the entrepreneurs that are out there will distribute themselves in some fashion, some curve. Maybe it'll be a bell curve like this one. Well, whatever index, whatever metrics you choose for, cho for evaluating entrepreneurs, there will be some number of those entrepreneurs, especially on the low end of your measure of entrepreneurial effectiveness, who are being blocked by regulation. And if we look, those are the ones that are uh, shaded here. And if we look over time, sadly, more and more uh, uh, entrepreneurs are being deterred each decade. This is a study of the number of new businesses created for every 10,000 working age Americans, and it has gone from 27 to 25 to 22 over the last three decades. Who knows what it'll fall to the next decade. Let's look at the impact of civil regulation on innovation. Here's one way to think about it. Let's say a law is introduced that specifies what is allowed and what is disallowed in a certain domain. Let's say this was done five years ago. Now, five years later, new forms of human collaboration have developed, new uh, technologies have made possible new dimensions of this space. So instead of merely being a two-dimensional space or uh, a hundred-dimensional space, it's a 150-dimensional space of human possibilities. So that regulation, now, five years later, disallows not just one dimension of human possibility, but multiple dimensions. But it's worse than that. 
Because the regulation is not a single clear boundary between what is allowed and disallowed, but it's a jagged boundary that gets increasingly irregular as time goes on, as that regulation gets amended and uh, revised and so forth. And it takes time and money to explore the crevices and uh, jags of that uh, regulation, and that advantages the well-funded and well-connected and influential. Uh, so this is a contributor to inequality that I think is often overlooked. Uh, here's another way to think about it. Uh, there are 100,000 uh, health and fitness mobile apps crammed into that tiny market space. Most of those 100,000 health and fitness mobile apps will not survive. There's just too many competitors for too small a market. Now, why is it that uh, all of those entrepreneurs are concentrated in that small area rather than addressing all of the other opportunities out there, aviation, construction, pharmaceuticals, uh, transportation, and so forth? Well, wittingly or unwittingly, entrepreneurs seek the most uh, the least regulated markets. If just a few of those entrepreneurs could be freed up to work in all of these other areas, many more of them would be successful and humanity and technology and quality of life would advance much more rapidly. Use of common law is also correlated with greater economic growth. A number of uh, studies show this. Uh, all of these socially beneficial outcomes that are listed here are associated with greater use of common law in a country. Uh, oops, excuse me. This is a, a study done by these uh, three economists, uh, the best known of whom is probably Andre Schleifer at Harvard. Uh, and then this study uh, by Bahoni shows that there is uh, more than half a percent per year greater a growth in GDP per capita in countries, in common law countries than in civil law countries. And to see that, uh, take a look at North America versus South America. North America, of course, has primarily inherited common law traditions from uh, Britain, from the, in the USA and in Canada. Uh, South America has primarily uh, inherited civil law traditions uh, from Spain. Well. The per capita income in North America is 37,000. In South America, it's 8,500, according to the IMF. Well, if you take, that's, that's a factor of 4.4 difference. If you take slightly more than one half of 1% that was referenced in the previous slide, and that would be 1.006, 1.005 would be half a percent, 1.006 is slightly more than that and raise it to the 250th power, that is uh, uh, compound that half a percent per year growth rate over the last two and a half centuries since the United States, Canada, and many of these countries in Latin America got established, you get approximately that ratio, 4.46. So the numbers hang together. Botswana was the fastest growing country in the world, worldwide, from 1965 to 1995. Uh, it enjoyed 7.7% uh, annual growth in uh, per capita income. Why is that? Well, it has enjoyed not one, but two forms of common law. Uh, it had its own tribal law, and when it was a protectorate of Britain after 1885, Britain uh, managed the country very lightly and gave stature to uh, Botswana's tribal law. Uh, and then uh, Botswana gained independence in 1996. It had a well-established uh, legal framework from which to grow uh, for the next 30 years. Uh, so um, another uh, success story. Uh, not just use of common law is sufficient. I emphasize. Uh, this is a study that looks at these uh, seven or eight uh, former British colonies, and then it ranks them according to uh, the rule of law in the countries today. 
And this study uh, tries to correlate factors with their success today. And they're all common law countries. Some of them are very successful, like Singapore. Some are less successful or unsuccessful, like Nigeria and Burma. Well, this study identifies two key factors, which is uh, uh, representation of local people in the legislature and integration of local and British common law uh, as, as drivers. And uh, here's a, a uh, very crude categorization of different countries of the world uh, in a two by two matrix, depending upon the extent of their common law tradition or influence and the quality of the governance. Uh, and uh, you can see that these countries here, uh, which are the highest per capita income countries for the most part, uh, enjoy both. Uh, this is very, so uh, substantial common law helps but is not sufficient for successful nationhood. Good governance is also essential. This is very much uh, consistent with uh, Asimoglu and Robinson uh, who wrote the book Why Nations Fail. Has anyone heard of that book? Uh, that uh, goes into depth on this subject. Let's look at a particular case study, drones, and see, compare how drones might be managed by ca uh, common law versus civil law. First of all, all of you know the applications of drones. They include, or potentially include, deliveries, farming, construction, filmmaking, and so forth. But there are also very real risks to drones. They can fall out of the sky. They can collide with other things. They can intrude on your privacy if they carry cameras. Drones are currently regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. There is a panoply of regulations that apply. They have to be used and can only be used well away from airports, only up to 400 feet, only within visual sight of operators, during daylight hours, for non-commercial purposes only, unless you have a special waiver from the FAA. For all practical purposes, unless you get a waiver from the FAA, uh, the use of drones is purely a hobbyist activity. What innovations do these regulations disincentivize? Well, the ability of the drone to recognize other objects and avoid those objects. Uh, no need to have that capability if, it's if you have to have a dedicated human operator for each drone. The ability to predict the future position of another flying object and avoid it. Uh, the ability to communicate in a peer-peer fashion with other flying objects. All of these are innovations that we could be enjoying in drones today, but for which there's no incentive for companies to develop. Another outcome of this is, not surprisingly, the top drone manufacturer in the world is not in the U.S. It's DJI uh, in, in uh, Shenzhen, uh, China, which owns two-thirds of the U.S a market over $1,000. The number two vendor, uh, 3D Robotics, has gone out of the hardware business and now just makes software for drones. Now, in contrast to that, how might drones be managed using common law? Well, uh, common law has long held, for centuries, uh, dangerous animal laws. Uh, if you own a dangerous animal, like a tiger or a snake, and that animal hurts somebody or uh, damages property, you, the owner, are responsible. That could very readily be extended to people or, or to drones. Similarly, peeping Tom laws have long been on the books uh, that have said it's illegal to peep secretly into a room <clears throat> occupied by other people and uh, or photograph uh, or video people in that room that law could also uh, readily be applied to drones. So there's already a very substantial body of law, common law, that could apply to drones. And then after we see what works and doesn't work with drones, then we could codify uh, uh, the, the laws uh, around drones. Would be a better way to go that would be less stifling of innovation. Finally, how can I turn my SEZ into a Silicon Valley? Everywhere I go around the world, people are asking, we want to create another Silicon Valley here. Well, it's understandable why people feel that way. Look at all the familiar brand names that are in Silicon Valley, Oracle, Facebook, Google, a Apple, Intel. Uh, and uh, in recent years, the last 15 or 20 years, 
Silicon Valley has expanded into the south of market region of San Francisco, and there we see Uber, Salesforce, Twitter, and others. So, uh, first to understand is that ecosystems like Silicon Valley are self-organizing. No one says that your company will purchase from this company and that company or sell to this company. That whole network uh, emerges, is constantly changing and shifting, is completely unpredictable. It's also impossible to know if you added a new node, a new company to that network, how it might blossom, and if you took away a particular node in that network, how it might dry up. Um, Silicon Valley is over a century old. Most people don't realize how old Silicon Valley was, but it was in 1910 that the first high-tech spin-out happened in Silicon Valley. Stanford provided uh, much of the impetus early on, um, and uh, the, uh, the U.S. military has provided periodic boosts, which has helped Silicon Valley, yes, but it's also provided volatility because when demand for new technologies uh, dried up because a war was over, uh, Silicon Valley had to figure out how to deal with that. No one could have predicted that telegraph, wireless technology would have given rise to vacuum tubes, to instruments, to semiconductors, all the way up to uh, AI and autonomous vehicles today. At most, you can predict uh, maybe two or three years out, but beyond that, it's uh, at a very broad level, yes, we can say Moore's Law is likely to continue, but what real products is that going to enable? No one can predict. So there's no way Silicon Valley could have been designed top down uh, as so many uh, folks who want to start SEZs envision that they're going to be able to do. So here are some general features of Silicon Valley. Companies spin out from trade and position themselves and compete with each other, all spontaneously, that's self-organization. There are many, many more failures than there are successes. We tend not to hear much about the failures. We just hear about the successes. But for every failure, there is learning taking place. There are many more small successes than there are large successes. We hear about the unicorns, the country, companies that are worth over a billion dollars, we don't hear about all of the transactions that take place where a company is sold from anywhere from one to $50 million. Uh, but these transactions uh, distribute wealth very broadly throughout the region. And uh, it's even the most successful venture capitalists get maybe one or two bets right. Uh, and they are not distracted by other uh, considerations as uh, so many political leaders are. Uh, probably the most notable example is Solyndra, the solar energy company that received over half a billion dollars in funding from the California, uh, state of California and the Department of Energy, all of which was lost when they went out of business. Uh, it's, uh, so so it's, it's, we need to keep in mind it's very hard to predict uh, winners and losers. Uh, and also, it's, uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's over a century old, so don't expect to create a Silicon Valley overnight. I have participated in lots of uh, what I call entrepreneurship marketing events, elevator pitch competitions, business plan competitions. Uh, the, uh, there are lots of programs that provide short-term tax incentives and try to target target industries. I, I'm not completely dismissive of these programs because I think they do elevate and make visible the importance of entrepreneurship and help encourage young people who might not have thought about being entrepreneurs, uh, becoming entrepreneurs, but I do think that this is not where the real work lies to create entrepreneurial areas and, and uh, Silicon Valleys. Rather, uh, these provide short-term PR benefits. Politics can often uh, uh, conflict with economics as, we, as in the case of Solyndra. And the real hard work is creating more attractive business environments, lower, lower tax and friendlier regulatory environments. So, 
I, I uh, refer to uh, some of these initiatives disparagingly as uh, uh, entrepreneurship theater. Now, what is the right way to go about creating another Silicon Valley? Well, here's a very simple model where the attractiveness of the economic environment gives rise to a net inflow of entrepreneurs into the region which lead to long-term economic growth, innovation, and higher standards of living. And let me talk about this second one first, uh, the net flow of entrepreneurs into or out of the region. So choose some region. I use here the example of Western Australia. Uh, so the, the index is the number who enter the region minus the number who leave the region divided by uh, some, some metric like the population of the region or the number of entrepreneurs in the region. You can de define it different ways. I haven't done the math for Western Australia, I don't, and I don't even know if we're tracking it. But I think this is a very good index for uh, SEZs or, or aspiring SEZs to track to see how well they're actually doing. Now here's a question, how well is Silicon Valley itself doing on this measure? Well, the answer is not that well, so-so. Uh, uh, if you look at the 10 US state-to-state -state migrations, uh, four of the top 10 migrations are out of the state of California. Number one is from New York to San Francisco as baby boom uh, to Florida as baby boomers are retiring. Number two is from California to Texas and, and so forth. And in fact, um, four of, of them are, are out of California, as you can see here. Uh, if you zoom in a little more closely to the two counties that most directly comprise, uh, that Silicon Valley most directly comprises, namely Santa Clara and San Mateo County, uh, and divide the folks who are entering or leaving uh, the uh, region as uh, foreign immigration or domestic integration, you can see right now where ex uh, foreign immigration has into the region has been roughly constant at that uh, dark red level, but uh, domestic integration has been, the outflow has been increasing these last few years, uh, even with a strong economy. If you go back and look at the past, usually it, it, uh, the outflow is increasing when there's a weak economy like the dot-com bust or the financial crisis of 2008. Now we're in a very strong economy and yet there's a net outflow of, of uh, domestic folks. Where are they going? Well, the number one state they're going to is Texas and the number one cities in Texas are these, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, Fort Worth. Now, why is Texas more attractive to Californians than California? Well, there's, for one, there's no state income tax, and California has one of the highest. It'll effectively become even higher under the new tax legislation. There's a lower cost of living, it's a friendlier regulatory environment, lower cost labor. So instead of thinking, how can I turn my SEZ into a Silicon Valley, maybe I should be thinking, how to turn my SEZ into a Texas. Now let's look at the other uh, uh, element of that model, which is the attractiveness of the economic environment. And for that, um, I turn to the World Bank Doing Business Index, which, is a, which ranks 190 countries worldwide from number one, the easiest to do business, to number 190, the most difficult, using all of these different metrics as a composite. How easy is it to get electricity? How easy is it to get title to property? How easy is it to uh, get credit and so forth? Where, well, no matter where your region or country ranks on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, let's say it is number 14 as in the case of Australia, here's a goal that is manageable, achievable, measurable and will benefit every single person in your region. Cut your rank in half in the next five years. So if you're currently at 14, your goal would be to be number seven. If you're currently at 100 as India is, and to India's great credit, they improved from 130 to 100 
over this last year on this ranking, their goal would be to be number 50. Uh, this is a very achievable goal. Countries routinely move by one or two positions without even doing anything. So with a concerted effort, uh, uh, a country, a district region, or an SEZ can, can uh, uh, really improve their position. Now, how are California and Texas doing along these measures? Well, the World Bank uh, Doing Business Index doesn't apply to individual states, but there is a similar index put out by Cato called the Freedom of the 50 States, which similarly uh, ranks uh, those uh, 50 states. And uh, sadly, uh, they're not doing well. Uh, California is number 49. Even Texas is only 28. <clears throat> so who's number one on that list? It is New Hampshire. Now, why is New Hampshire number one on the, uh, on the list? Well, over the last recent years, they've put in place a number of initiatives to cut taxes and very deliberately to eliminate obsolete regulations, 1,600 of them as shown here. And the results have been tax revenues have actually increased as more and more country, uh, companies, especially those in the Boston area, move across the line uh, into southern New Hampshire uh, and do business there rather than deal with the Massachusetts uh, state taxes. And employment has actually been rising. In addition to those economic freedoms, uh, New Hampshire has put in place a number of uh, personal freedoms, uh, including all of the ones that are listed here. These probably, it seems to me, add additional uh, positive impact on entrepreneurship, employment, and economic growth uh, in the state. So instead of how, thinking about how to turn my SEZ into a Silicon Valley, or even a Texas, maybe uh, we should be thinking about how to turn our SEZ into a New Hampshire. Well, let me conclude with recommendations uh, for special economic zones. First, let common law flourish. Start with a minimal kernel constitution that provides freedoms, speech, free trade, labor, capital, property. Separate state from church, economics, education, Provide some means for dispute resolution, either public or private. Extend property, private property, as far as uh, it can reasonably be defined to land, to water, and air. This will minimize tragedies of the commons and the need for regulations to govern those. And let the law grow and evolve naturally uh, with society, customs, technology, and the economy. When statutes are more cost-effective and scalable, let them reflect common law. Start by making them responsive, i.e. permissionless, as is common law. Uh, they're invoked only in the case of a dispute. If there's no dispute, there's no need for the law to be evo uh, invoked. Focus on objectives, not specifications. The objectives are the drone must be operated safely. Uh, Cars in the U.S. require three rear view mirrors, one on the left, one on the right, one in the middle. We're getting more and more to a point where we're using video cameras. Uh, I can imagine a future day where we will all have video cameras and those three uh, rear view mirrors will be vestiges of a bygone era, but they'll still be on the book, so we'll still have them uh, in our cars even though they're never used, just because we can't get the law changed. So. Uh, focus not on the means, but on the objectives. Start general, and then as the standards evolve in that field, let the civil law follow. So for example, start out perhaps with something very broad, like drones will not harm people or property. And uh, later, as drones, the overwhelming majority of them perhaps, gain the ability to sense and detect other objects and avoid them. Maybe that will become part of what a reasonable person would consider reasonable, and therefore it'll become part of the law for drones. And, and provide large areas for learning. Right now, we're not learning very much about drones because the areas where they can be used are so limited. Probably most of the learning about drones is happening outside of the US. 
What if, for example, there was a highway in the sky between 300 feet and 400 feet where drones could operate freely using whatever t techniques and going in whatever directions they wanted to, uh, understanding that they have to avoid objects, uh, either other flying objects or stationary objects that extend up there. With that kind of ex er, broad region for experimentation, we'd learn very quickly uh, uh, about how to improve drones. Here's a quote from Richard Epstein in his book, Simple Rules for a Complex World, that I very like, very much like. Don't try to handle every single case in the civil law. Uh, that will lead to the system's unraveling. Uh, cover the majority of the cases, and then when new cases arise, rely on a court case to uh, make a decision, and then when there's a clear pattern in those cases, then codify that. Uh, design and manage statutes cautiously with full awareness of their risks and liabilities. And this is taken from Appendix E of my book, Unleash Your Inner Company, uh, which provides in addition, the book is primarily a guide to entrepreneurs, but uh, parts of it are also a guide to policymakers for how to promote entrepreneurship in your regions. Uh, so these are a bunch of suggestions. Of course, we've already talked about letting common law inform uh, statutory design, bound the applicability of the law, test on small scales, require innovation impact assessments. Just as we require uh, environmental impact assessments today of a new real estate development, uh, how about an in innovation impact assessment of an, any new regulation? What new innovation is this going to be either precluding or disincentivizing by putting it in place? Here's an example of how a very widely accepted uh, in a, a, a regulation could be having negative consequences that we're not even aware of. Uh, we have in place ramps uh, for sidewalks uh, th throughout the country. And of course, that have lots of benefits. It helps people in wheelchairs. It helps people who use baby carriages, bicycles, you name it. Uh, but think about what investments those ramps may be disincentivizing. There's less reason for people to invest in smart prosthetic devices and wheelchairs that can negotiate stairs as a result of uh, those ramps. And uh, th so uh, people who might benefit from a smart uh, set of prosthetics or wheelchair that could actually climb stairs are not getting the benefit of that innovation uh, because there are so many cases where uh, it's not needed or, or th there's no uh, incentive to create it. I'm not, I'm not saying they are, but, th but they might be. That's an example of what I mean by an innovation impact assessment. If regulations are more than about 100 pages, people won't read them, people won't uh, be able to figure out what their unintended consequences are, or all the consequences are unintended. And then whenever a regulation is put in place, reserve at least some region where it does not apply, for two reasons. One is, to ensure continued innovation uh, of uh, whatever technologies might be affected. Uh, there may, it may not be any difference, but at least we'll know. And second, to better assess the impact of that regulation so we have a control to compare it with. And finally, use sunset clauses. By that I mean make sure that the regulation uh, has to be systematically reviewed and reapproved every some number of years, perhaps three or five years. Whatever number of years you choose, it should probably be decreasing every decade because the pace of innovation and technological change is increasing every decade and the uh, length of time any particular regulation might be applicable uh, is declining every decade. And finally, create not Silicon Valleys but New Hampshire's. How to do that? Aim for the lowest tax rates, the lightest regulation, the most efficient administration. Don't try to pick winners uh, and attract them. Uh, it's impossible to know which particular company or industry will complete an ecosystem and let it blossom. Our small minds think it might be in this area, but it could be in a completely different area. 
create an attractive environment for all entrepreneurs and in industries, and be sure to have a long-term view. Entrepreneurs won't be attracted to move into a particular region with short-term tax incentives, or if they don't trust that uh, the attractive laws are going to be in place indefinitely. Uh, so it takes time. Finally, don't try to emulate Silicon Valley or any other region. Just be the best and freest that your SCZ can be. Thank you very much.